Warning, the following contains images of graphic violence and not suitable for all audiences viewer discretion is advised. Amanda Knox was born July 9, 1987, in Seattle, Washington, the eldest of three daughters born to Edda Mellas, a mathematics teacher originally from Germany, and Kurt Knox, a vice president of finance for Macy's. Knox and her sisters were raised in West Seattle. Her parents were divorced when she was 10 years old, her mother then married Chris Mellis, an information technology consultant. Amanda Marie Knox, born July 9, 1987, is an American author, activist, and journalist. She spent almost four years incarcerated in Italy after her wrongful conviction in the 2007 murder of Meredith Kircher, a fellow exchange student, with whom she shared an apartment in Perugia. In 2015, Knox was definitively acquitted by the Italian Supreme Court of Cassation. In 2024, an Italian appellate court upheld Amanda Knox slander conviction for falsely accusing Patrick Lumumba of murdering Meredith Kircher. Knox, aged 20 at the time of the murder, called the police after returning to her and Kircher's apartment after a night spent with her boyfriend, Rafael Salicito, and finding Kircher's bedroom door locked and blood in the bathroom. During the police interrogations that followed, the conduct of which is a matter of dispute, Knox allegedly implicated herself and her employer, Patrick Lumumba, in the murder. Initially, Knox, Salicito, and Lumumba were all arrested for Kircher's murder, but Lumumba was soon released because he had a strong alibi. A known burglar, Rudy Geed, was soon arrested, after his bloody fingerprints were found on Kircher's possessions. He was convicted of murder in a fast-track trial and was sentenced to 30 years imprisonment, later reduced to 16 years. In December 2020, an Italian court ruled that Gide could complete his term by doing community service. In their initial trial, in 2009, Knox and Salicito were convicted and sentenced to 26 and 25 years in prison, respectively. Pre-trial publicity in Italian media, which was repeated by other media worldwide, portrayed Knox in a negative light, leading to complaints that the prosecution was using character assassination. A guilty verdict at Knox's initial trial and her 26-year sentence caused international controversy, because American forensic experts thought evidence at the crime scene was incompatible with her involvement. A prolonged legal process, including a successful prosecution appeal against her acquittal at a second-level trial, continued after Knox was freed in 2011. On March 27, 2015, Italy's highest court definitively exonerated Knox and Salicito. However, Knox's conviction for committing defamation against Lumumba was upheld by all courts. On January 14, 2016, Knox was acquitted of defamation for saying she had been struck by policewomen during the interrogation. Knox later became an author, an activist, and a journalist. Her memoir, Waiting to be Heard, became a bestseller. In 2018, she began hosting The Scarlet Letter Reports, a television series, which examined the gendered nature of public shaming. Knox had come to Perugia for its universities, and because it had fewer tourists than Florence, a more popular destination for foreign students. Knox lived in a four-bedroom, ground-floor apartment at Via della Pergola, seven with three other women. Her flatmates were Kircher, a British exchange student, and two Italian trainee lawyers in their late twenties, one of whom was Filomena Romanelli. Kircher and Knox moved in on September 10 and 20, 2007, respectively, meeting each other for the first time Knox was employed part-time at a bar, Le Chic, which was owned by a Congolese man, Dia Patrick Lumumba. Kircher's English female friends saw relatively little of Knox, who preferred to socialize with Italians. Giacomo Silenzi, who lived in a walkout semi-basement apartment of the building, shared an interest in music with Kircher and Knox and often visited their apartment. Returning home at 2 a.m. one night in mid-October, Knox, Kircher, Silenzi, and another basement resident met a basketball court acquaintance of the Italians, Rudy Gide, in the basement apartment. At 4.30 a.m. Kircher left, saying she was going to bed, and Knox followed her out. Geed spent the rest of the night in the basement. Knox recalled a second night out with Kircher and Silenzi, in which Geed joined them in the basement apartment. Three weeks before her death, Kircher went with Knox to the Eurochocolate Festival. On October 20, 
Kircher became romantically involved with Silenzi, after going to a nightclub with him as part of a small group that included Knox. Guy visited the basement later that day. On October 25, Kircher and Knox went to a concert, where Knox met Rafael Salicito, a 23-year-old software engineering student. Knox began spending her time at his flat, a five-minute walk from Via della Pergola 7. November 1 was a public holiday, and the Italians living in the building were away. It is believed that after watching a movie at a friend's house, Kircher returned home around 9 p.m. that evening and was alone in the building. Just after midday on November 2, Knox called Kircher's English phone. But contrary to her normal practice, the call was not answered. Knox then called her roommate Filomena Romanelli, and in a mixture of Italian and English said she was worried something had happened to Kircher, because upon going to the Via della Pergola 7 apartment earlier that morning, Knox had noticed an open front door, bloodstains, including a footprint, in the bathroom, and Kircher's bedroom door locked. Knox and Salicito then went to Via della Pergola 7, and upon getting no answer from Kircher, unsuccessfully tried to break in the bedroom door, leaving it noticeably damaged. At 12.47 p.m., Knox called her mother, who advised her to contact the police. Salicito called the Carabinieri, one of Italy's national police forces, getting through at 12.51 p.m. He was recorded telling them there had been a break-in with nothing taken, and the emergency was that Kircher's door was locked, she was not answering calls to her phone, and there were bloodstains. Police telecommunications investigators arrived to inquire about an abandoned phone, which was in fact, Kircher's Italian unit. Romanelli arrived and took over, explaining the situation to the police, who were informed about Kircher's English phone, which had been handed in as a result of its ringing when Knox called it. On discovering Kircher's English phone had been found dumped, Romanelli demanded that the policemen force Kircher's bedroom door open, but they did not think the circumstances warranted damaging private property. The door was then kicked in by a friend of Romanelli, and Kircher's body was discovered on the floor. She had been stabbed and had died of blood loss from neck wounds. The first detectives on the scene were Monica Napoleoni and her superior, Marco Cayacaira. Napoleoni conducted the initial interviews and quizzed Knox about her failure to immediately raise the alarm, which was later widely seen as an anomalous feature of Knox's behavior. During her initial questioning, Knox told authorities that Lumumba had broken into the home she shared with Kircher and other roommates, before sexually assaulting and killing her. Knox said that she had spent the night of November 1 with Salicito at his flat, smoking marijuana, watching the French film Amelie, and having sex. Salicito told police he could not remember if Knox was with him that evening or not. According to Knox, Napoleoni had been hostile to her from the outset. Kayakaira discounted the signs of a break-in, deeming them clearly faked by the killer. The police were not told the extent of Kircher's relationship with Silenzi in initial interviews. On November 4, Kayakaira was quoted as saying that someone known to Kircher might have been let into the apartment and be responsible for her murder. The same day, Geed is believed to have left Perugia. Over the following days, Knox was repeatedly interviewed as a witness. She told police that on November 1, she received a text from Lumumba advising that her evening waitressing shift had been cancelled, so she had stayed over at Salicito's apartment, only going back to the apartment she shared with Kircher on the morning the body was discovered. On the night of November 5, Knox voluntarily went to the police station. Knox was not provided with legal counsel. As Italian law only mandates the appointment of a lawyer for someone suspected of a crime, Knox said she had requested a lawyer, but was told it would make things worse for her. Knox testified that prior to the trial she had spent hours maintaining her original story, that she had been with Salicito at his flat all night and had no knowledge of the murder, but a group of police would not believe her. Police arrested Knox, Salicito, and Patrick Lumumba on November 6, 2007. They were taken into custody and charged with the murder. Customers who Lumumba had been serving at his bar on the night of the murder gave him an alibi, and Lumumba was released. Kaya Kaira, who thought the arrests were premature, dropped out of the investigation soon afterward, leaving Napoleoni in charge of a major investigation for the first time in her career. Knox's first meeting with her legal counsel was on November 11. 
After his blood-stained fingerprints were found on bedding under Kircher's body, Gied, who had fled to Germany, was extradited back to Italy. Gied, Knox, and Salicito were then charged with committing the murder together. On November 30, a panel of three judges endorsed the charges and ordered Knox and Salicito held in detention pending a trial. Knox became the subject of unprecedented pretrial media coverage because of leaks from the prosecution, including a best-selling Italian book whose author imagined or invented incidents that were purported to have occurred in Knox's private life. Geed fled to Germany shortly after the murder. During a November 19, 2007 Skype conversation with his friend Giacomo Benedetti, Geed did not mention Knox or Salicito as being in the building on the night of the murder. Later his account changed and he indirectly implicated them in the murder, which he denied involvement in. Geed was arrested in Germany on November 20, then extradited to Italy on December 6. Geed opted to be tried in a special fast-track procedure by Judge Michele. He was not charged with having had a knife, he did not testify and was not questioned about his statements, which he had changed compared to what he originally said. In October 2008, Geed was found guilty of the sexual assault and murder of Kircher, and sentenced to 30 years imprisonment. His prison sentence was ultimately reduced to 16 years. He was later given an early release in December 2020 and authorized to finish his sentence with community service. Amanda Knox was dissatisfied with his early release and spoke publicly against it. In 2009, Knox and Salicito pleaded not guilty at a corte de cease on charges of murder, sexual assault, carrying a knife, which Geed had not been charged with, simulating a burglary, and theft of 300 euros, two credit cards, and two mobile phones. There was no charge in relation to Kircher's missing keys to the entry door and her bedroom door, although Geed's trial judgment said he had not stolen anything. There was a separate but concurrent trial of Knox with the same jury as her murder trial, in which she was accused of falsely denouncing her employer for the murder. Knox's police interrogation was deemed improper and ruled inadmissible for the murder trial, but was heard in her nominally separate trial for false denunciation. According to the prosecution, Knox's first call of November 2, to Kircher's English phone, was to ascertain if Kircher's phones had been found, and Salicito had tried to break in the bedroom door because after he and Knox locked it behind them, they realized they had left something that might incriminate them. Knox's call to her mother in Seattle, 15 minutes before the discovery of the body, was said by prosecutors to show Knox was acting as if something serious might have happened before that point in time when an innocent person would have such concern. A prosecution witness, homeless man Antonio Corotolo, said Knox and Salicito were in a nearby square on the night of the murder. Prosecutors advanced a single piece of forensic evidence linking Salicito to Kircher's bedroom, where the murder had taken place, fragments of his DNA on Kircher's bra clasp Julia Bongiorno, leading Salicito's defense, questioned how Salicito's DNA could have gotten on the small metal clasp of the bra, but not on the fabric of the bra back strap from which it was torn. How can you touch the hook without touching the cloth? Bongiorno asked, the back strap of the bra had multiple traces of DNA belonging to Gied. According to the prosecution's reconstruction, Knox had attacked Kircher in her bedroom, repeatedly banged her head against a wall, forcefully held her face, and tried to strangle her. Gied, Knox, and Salicito had removed Kircher's jeans and held her on her hands and knees while Gied had sexually abused her. Knox had cut Kircher with a knife before inflicting the fatal stab wound, then faked a burglary. The judge pointedly questioned Knox about a number of details, especially concerning her phone calls to her mother and Romanelli. The defense suggested that Gied was a lone killer who had murdered Kircher after breaking in. Knox's lawyers pointed out that no shoe prints, clothing fibers, hairs, fingerprints, skin cells, or DNA of Knox's were found on Kircher's body, clothes, handbag, or anywhere else in Kircher's bedroom. The prosecution alleged that all forensic traces in the room that would have incriminated Knox had been wiped away by her and Salicito. Knox's lawyer said it would have been impossible to selectively remove her traces, and emphasized that Gied's shoe prints, fingerprints, and DNA were found in Kircher's bedroom. Gied's DNA was on the strap of Kircher's bra, which had been torn off, and his DNA was found on a vaginal swab taken from her body. 
Geed's bloody palm print was on a pillow that had been placed under Kircher's hips. Geed's DNA, mixed with Kircher's, was on the left sleeve of her bloody sweatshirt and in bloodstains inside her shoulder bag, from which 300 euros and credit cards had been stolen. Both sets of defense lawyers requested the judges to order independent reviews of evidence including DNA and the compatibility of the wounds with the alleged murder weapon. The request was denied. In final pleas to the court, Salicito's lawyer described Knox as a weak and fragile girl who had been duped by the police. Knox's lawyer pointed to text messages between Knox and Kircher as showing that they had been friends. I am so grateful to have my life back. Um, thank you. And that's, that's all I can say. I Right now, I'm still absorbing what all of this means and the what what comes to mind is my my gratitude for for the life that's been given to me what does the future hold for you i don't know i'm i'm still absorbing the present moment which is full of joy in the nearly six years since amanda knox was accused of killing her roommate in italy her story's captivated the world for many reasons, because she's a bright-eyed, all-American girl, it seems, because she was convicted of a horrid crime in a foreign land, and because, at times, her pleas for innocence seemed to many people more cold and calculating than remorseful. Tonight, ABC's Diane Sawyer speaks with Knox in an exclusive interview just weeks after the Italian Supreme Court overturned her acquittal. So every word she says here, and in the pages of her new book, Waiting to be Heard, could affect her freedom. An American girl home in Seattle, back with her sisters, now grown up. <laughs> nice, okay. neither of us fell. Sometimes she says she's just that daughter who never left and wanted to be near her parents. She was always, you know, home and, yeah. Eating your food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My mom, I can tell anything to. Anything. Sometimes when she doesn't even want to hear it. <laughs> There is much to hear, a five and a half year old journey that began in a Seattle suburb and ended with Amanda Knox becoming a global obsession. In headlines called a sexual thrill seeker, a seductress, the murderer of her British roommate, Meredith Kircher. She devil with an angel face, heartless manipulator, concertante of sex, sphinx of perusia. I haven't heard those, I mean. I've heard the gist of them, and uh, they're wrong. For all intents and purposes, I was a murderer, whether I was or not. She had stayed near home for college, made Dean's List, but when she was a junior, decided it was time to venture out. An adventure of fill in the blank. An adventure of selfhood. She worked three separate jobs to earn the money for her year abroad. Her mom was excited. Wanting me to go for it, to be brave, to go out and be my own person. I really got that from my mom. Her sister Deanna dropping her off in Italy and making a video as they head there, teasing her about her new life with the boys she'll meet. First, that naked Michelangelo statue of David. Are you excited to see David? Uh, David. David, the statue of David. Oh. <laughs> well, dude. I swear to God, I don't know what it is about people who think that guys are not attractive physically, but... You look at the picture of the girl who arrived there, what would you want to say? I want to tell her not to be afraid of what's going to happen, because what happened to me hit, hit me like a, tr a train and there was nothing I could do to stop it. She has only been in Italy five weeks, going to school in the morning, working at a bar at night. One night with Meredith, she goes to a classical music concert and sees a young man who reminds her of Harry Potter, a graduate student in computer science. Raffaele Selecito says he can't believe the beautiful, uninhibited American is looking at him. Colpe di fumine. Un colpe di fumine. That's a, a lightning strike. Yeah, um, he, he writes about how taken he was with me, and I really liked him as well. They become a couple for just one week, seven days, 
before they enter the 24 hours that are at the center of this mystery and this debate, starting with the night of November 1st, when Meredith Kircher is murdered. What are you doing the night of November 1st? November 1st, we stayed in, and we had dinner. We watched a movie. A witness confirmed she and Raffaele were in his apartment as late as 8.40 p.m. His computer confirms that someone had ordered the movie, Amelie. We smoked. We had sex. We were together. We just hung out together. We made faces at each other. We were being silly and together. How high were you? I had smoked a joint with Raphael, and what that did to my memories was it made them less concrete, but it didn't black them out and it didn't change them. You remember with clarity that you did not go out that night. You stayed in the whole night. We stayed in the whole night. The next morning, it is undisputed that Knox is the first person in the house after the murder. She says she made the five-minute walk from Raffaele's apartment to take a shower at home and get fresh clothes. You go home to take a shower? He has a shower. Why go home? Well, he had a crummy shower. She says she noticed the front door standing open, thought it was odd, but the latch didn't always work. She took a shower after seeing blood in the bathroom sink. She says wondering if maybe Meredith hadn't cleaned it up, or was it her own newly pierced ears? At the sink when I was taking out my earrings that I noticed that there were speckles of blood. But speckles, a few drops. Did you see the bath uh, mat? Did you not see yet, mat? not yet. I saw that when I was getting out of the shower and I thought it was strange. But you know people look at this and they say, door open, blood in the bathroom, those are red alarms. Well, I had never before experienced anything in my life that was drastic. I didn't think, oh my God, someone's been in here and murdered someone. Amanda Knox says she went back to Raffaele's and then they returned to the house together. They saw evidence of a break-in and Raffaele calls police. Her roommate, Philomena, is there and the door to Meredith's bedroom is knocked in. Amanda Knox says she's on the phone with her mother when she hears a torrent of Italian she doesn't understand. And someone was screaming a foot. And I said, I don't know, I don't understand. Then Philomena was crying out Meredith, and so I heard that it must be Meredith, and that there was a body, and that there was an armoire, and there was blood, and there was a blanket. From this point on, Amanda Knox and her behavior will be a kind of kaleidoscope, shifting shapes depending on what you see, what you think is inappropriate behavior and evidence of guilt, or as she says, just a kind of tone-deaf girl in a trauma. Police will say her strange behavior is guilt and heartlessness. Did you kill Meredith Kircher? No. Were you there that night? No. Do you know anything you have not told police that you have not said in this book? Do you know anything? No. I don't. I wasn't there. At the police station, she sits in Raffaele's lap, playfully making faces, telling Meredith's friends that Meredith must have suffered. You're quoted as saying, how could she not? She got her effing throat slit. I was angry. I was pacing, thinking about what Meredith was, must have been through. Sorry about that now. I wish I could have been more mature about it. Yeah. You can see that this does not look like grief. It does not read as grief. I think everyone's reaction to something horrible is different. The first image much of the world will see on newscasts. Video taken outside the house the day of the murder. I've seen the same picture, like the kissing just can't stop. And that's not what that was. When you look at the tape, there are three quick kisses, then the rest of the time she stares into space. She says, thinking about random fate. I felt very lost, very alone, and very vulnerable. Vulnerable. My friend had been murdered, and it could just have easily been me.
Somehow, she had died in the house where we were living. And it could have been me. She would be arrested, convicted, sentenced to 26 years. When we come back, she talks about the long nights in prison and the encounter with a prison official. It was always after lights were out and no one was out and about in the prison and he would call me into an empty office and talk to me. Just talk? 